Hi, my name's Don Murray. Uh, I've been a member of the Northrop Corporation uh, flight test organization for almost 60 years. My very first program as a new graduate engineer back in early 63 was the X21A Laminar Flow Demonstration Program. Laminar flow control was Northrop's designation of a method to reduce parasite drag by uh, sucking away the boundary layer that it decelerated to a very low speed and leaving only the high speed portion of the boundary layer. This was done by sucking the boundary layer air through spanwise slots in the wing. This is a small sample of the upper wing structure, but there's, you, know, you can't see them, but there's spanwise slots, point three thousandths to ten thousandths of an inch. They were all court wise on the upper and lower surface and span wise throughout the full span of the wing. Uh, sucking the boundary layer air through those slots, through these holes in the bottom, and along these would be ducts inboard to the suction units that were located near the fuselage. As I mentioned, the uh, Northrop's method of reducing parasite drag by their laminar flow control uh, method uh, had been demonstrated analytically by Dr. Fenninger and empirically by wind tunnel model testing and in the late 50s uh, on a club section that had been installed on a F-94C Starfire wing. Now there were four objectives of the X-21A contract. The first one is to demonstrate laminar flow control in its final stage as an application for a swept wing airline transport. That's the reason the B-66 was chosen and we'll discuss that configuration in a couple of minutes. The second contract requirement was to demonstrate the construction techniques for the laminar flow control system and how the air is channeled off the wing into the internal structure and through the pumping pods and uh, exited externally at the tail of the airplane. The third contract requirement was to demonstrate laminar flow control in a laminar boundary layer at Reynolds numbers that equated to the predicted performance at that time of, of airline transports. Most of our testing was done at 0.75 Mach number at 40,000 feet. And um, we'll talk about the results of that later on. The uh, fourth major objective was to um, demonstrate the uh, cost impact of operating a laminar flow control equipped airplane and the cost of maintaining the laminar flow control system in the commercial market on a transport airplane. The X-21A was developed from the Douglas B-66 bomber. The B-66 was a second generation jet bomber, uh, first flew in 1954, was used as a bomber and a weather recon airplane and lastly as an electronic warfare airplane during the Vietnam War. It had a very long career. Now, what we did for an X-21, this is the X-21, we took the wings and engines off the B-66 and installed a wing that was half again as big, 1,250 square feet versus 750 square feet. This is to get the better angle attack and so forth to represent what an airliner would, be, would experience during flight. Uh, the pumping pods were in these nacelles the here. There, there was two of them. One of them driven by bleed air off the engines and another one had had its own, own gas generator. And lastly, we put J79-13 engines back here in pods for the power plants. Uh, it was a non-afterburning version of the J79. A uh, little bit underpowered, but it, it did get the job done. As I mentioned previously, the X-21A wing consisted of a extra layer, if you will, of structure on the top and bottom surfaces that contained minor slots, uh, span-wise and full cord-wise that sucked the boundary layer air in, ducting inside the wing that brought that boundary layer into the pumping pods, and the pumping sod pod would take that air and push it out, 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 the, out the exhaust. There were engineers in the what used to be the weather compartment under here with the controls to vary the distribution of the suction cord-wise uh, to uh, get the optimum distribution to obtain laminar flow uh, in, the, in the boundary layer. 
uh, was not an easy task. It took a long time, even with the data from the empirical tests previously and the analytical data, it, it took a while to get the actual airplane's pressure distribution optimum to get laminar flow across, across the wing surfaces. Okay, the X-21A fuselage configuration, as I mentioned, the main power plants were located back here from where they were on the wings on the B-66. And uh, we had a flight test boom out the front to measure total pressure and the airplane attitude. All the pressure instrumentation on the wing was referenced to free stream total pressure. And the whole idea of the program was to demonstrate that the total probes and rakes along the trailing edge, uh, the differential pressure between those readings and the flight test boom were essentially zero. We had the gauges calibrated in inches of water and anything below two inches of water delta P was considered to be laminar flow. You know, the standard atmosphere equals 471 inches of water, so two inches is a very, very small differential pressure. As I mentioned, the weather compartment uh, from the WB-66 was converted to a station where the two flight test engineers set to operate the laminar flow control system. One engineer for the right wing, one engineer for the left wing. He had controls for all the valves and the pumping units at his disposal in a center console. Uh, they had in front of them, each had a photo panel containing approximately 100 differential pressure gauges. What we did was we took altimeters and reconfigured them to read in inches of water and become differential pressure gauges. Uh, we had a 50 channel oscillograph and uh, also a temperature uh, recording device for temperatures to get air densities within the wing. This was the last application of what I call World War II instrumentation for, for Northrop. At this time, in early 1963, the F5 FSD program had already started using digital uh, tape recorders on board the airplane and was getting away from the um, instrumentation I just described. As I mentioned, the uh, quality of the boundary layer uh, was measured by total temperature probes on the trailing edge of the wing. There were 20 single probes near the wing surface at the trailing edge on each wing and three pressure rake assemblies on each wing to get, get a pressure profile. We also measured temperatures inside the ducts and we had microphones to evaluate the noise level when the boundary layer changed from turbulent to laminar. Now onto the program highlights, as I said, uh, I joined the company in January 1963 as a neophyte flight test engineer just out of college and uh, got to witness the mate of the uh, laminar flow control wing to the first airplane and uh, spent the next several months calibrating all the instrumentation. Uh, flight test organization wants to emphasize to new people that our product is data so the first thing you do is get eminently involved with the data systems on whichever airplane that you're testing. By March of 1963, the calibrations were complete. The engine ground runs had been made and we started our low and high speed taxi test at Hawthorne Airport. That testing uh, was completed without any problems and the airplane was ferried from Hawthorne Airport to Edwards Air Force Base on April 15, 1963. The second airplane followed about three months later in August of 1963. We completed the initial airworthiness testing, handling qualities and so forth uh, by June of 1963 and started evaluating the uh, performance of the laminar flow control system. The first uh, laminar flow was obtained in uh, June of 1963 on an outer portion of the first airplane. We were having considerable difficulty obtaining and maintaining repeatable laminar flow in the outer wing panels. And uh, we realized we had to uh, make the wing surface smoother than what the as-manufactured wing was. Uh, technology at that time, there was still some waviness in the wing surface. And so we all learned how to use Bondo filler and we bondoed and sanded the wing smooth. And this was an ongoing task throughout the program. We also had to keep the little slots clear. They, they, were, they, were, they were clogging up. And so every pre and post flight activity involved clearing the slots, sanding more Bondo, and unplugging the little holes that you saw in that sample that I had. By November of 1964, we had a considerable amount of flying time with the laminar flow control system on both airplanes. We had managed to obtain 
fairly repeatable laminar flow boundary layer on the outboard portions of the wings, upper and lower surface, but we're not getting any noticeable laminar flow control impact on the inner surface. You will notice on a picture of the airplane in flight shooting down on the wing, we took uh, plastic tubing, hooked it to the trailing edge probes and moved the probes forward to the leading edge of the wing to try to figure out what was going on that was keeping us from getting laminar flow in the inboard section of the wing. We found out the laminar boundary layer was being tripped at the leading edge of the wing at the wing root due to the way the intersection was designed. We uh, quit flying the first airplane and concentrated using the second airplane for developing fixes to the uh, wing root area. These involved uh, fences, a uh, various combination of uh, duct changes, and also uh, vertical slots in the, in the wings. We finally were able to get laminar flow on the inboard section of the wing uh, early to mid-1965. Uh, at this point, uh, I uh, was made part of the uh, flight crew. Uh, I'd spent the last previous two years plotting all the data from these and trying to figure out what the, what the problems were. And uh, as, as, as a flight crew, I was, uh, first of all, a flight test scribe. I sat behind the pilot and took, took down times and descriptions of every event. On some flights, we had craft paper on the leading edge of the wings to prevent bug impacts uh, following the uh, laminar flow. And one of my jobs was after takeoff and the gear was up, I hit an initiator that rolled the craft paper off the, uh, off the leading edges of the wings and deposited it neatly on the Edwards Dry Lake bed. I also operated air particle sampling devices. Uh, we found out when we got near visible moisture, we would lose lambda flow. And what I did was collect uh, ice particle data in a, in a solution that, that could be stored. And so we could correlate ice particle size with the impact on the laminar flow uh, of the uh, boundary layer. Our normal flight track was take off from Edwards and head eastbound to the Colorado River, turn left and go north to uh, Mountain Home, Idaho, turn left again and go west to Fairchild Air Force Base, go left again and come down uh, Central Oregon and the uh, Central Valley portion of the, of the California back to Edwards Air Force Base. This resulted in a flight time of approximately four hours, about three hours of which were at uh, 40,000 feet. As I said, the airplane was slightly underpowered and sometimes getting to 40,000 feet was a uh, chore. My uh, position sitting behind the pilot, uh, the B-66 was a single pilot airplane, so I could see the uh, throttle quadrants and his hand on the throttle quadrants, and I could see all the engine instruments. And uh, we were supposed to demonstrate a 30% reduction in the, the uh, boundary layer drag. And any of you that have flown J-79s and F-4s, you know at 300 knots at 0.75 Mach number, uh, you're burning about 3,000 pounds an hour. Well, I could sit there and watch that fuel flow gauge, and as the guys in the back got the LFC working right, I could see fuel flow drop from 3,000 pounds down to almost 2,000 pounds, which is our 30%. So uh, that was kind of a real-time data review there that I got from my, from my seat in the airplane. Also, the pilot was always cussing about how he was having a hard time holding the Mach number down as the airplane got more and more laminar. Of the four program requirements, we wound up meeting three of them well, and the fourth one, not so very well. Uh, we did demonstrate we could obtain a laminar boundary layer at a uh, cruise condition, 0.75 Mach number, 40,000 feet. We were able to uh, obtain laminar flow on 70% of the wetted area of the wing. And this corresponded to the 30% drag reduction that they were looking for. And we were able to obtain, obtain a laminar boundary layer at a Reynolds number of 45 million, which is uh, over a quarter of about 17 feet at that flight condition. And this was comparable to what small jet airliners would be flying at. The last objective, we did obtain data on the cost to maintain the laminar flow control system. Uh, as I had mentioned earlier, there's a tremendous amount of labor involved pretty much 24-7 on keeping the wings smooth and the slots open and, the, and all the ducting clear. Uh, also, there was maintenance to the extra uh, pumping units in addition to the main engines. Uh, 
and we, we, we proved that it was not going to be, at that time, economically viable to immediately put this system on a uh, commercial aircraft. The last flight on the X-21A was in December of 1965. Uh, program constraints and cost constraints uh, dictated that, along with the fact that uh, the Vietnam War had started and all the B-66s were needed uh, for uh, electronic countermeasures warfare in Vietnam and they needed a lot of the components off our two airplanes that were common with B-66 to support the EB-66s in Vietnam. So as you can see from these two photographs, the airplanes were taken out to the photo resolution range at Edwards and all the parts were stripped off of them and they both remain out there to this day. I haven't been out there in 10 years, but they look about the same, I'm sure. And if anybody ever wants to try to make one flyable X-21A out of those two airplanes, I've got the flight manual for you right here. I want to thank you all for viewing this video today. Uh, I thought it was very important to document all this history because uh, it's rapidly going by the wayside as, as the years and events go by. Uh, this program was very important to me, not only because of my, it was my first one in Northrop as a flight test engineer, but the uh, experience gained uh, held me in good stead for later programs with the company. Again, thank you for watching, and please support the Western Museum of Flight. Uh, your support helps make these videos possible.